Um, it's a huge uh, pleasure for me uh, today to be uh, chairing this event uh, in conjunction with the TUC. Um, the Labour Movement for Europe obviously exists uh, in uh, many different uh, uh, parts of, uh, of the Labour Movement, but the Labour Movement for Europe exists to foster the closest possible relationship that we possibly can uh, with our European partners. Uh, obviously, we, we're not going to rehearse the last four years in the history of uh, Britain's departure from the European Union, but uh, there are clearly uh, huge questions um, that have opened up as a result of the UK's departure from the European Union. And central, of course, to those questions is the issues of human rights, workers' rights, uh, the protections that exist or no longer exist or could exist or indeed should exist. Uh, for uh, people uh, in the uh, workplace. Uh, what does it mean for a labour movement fighting for the strongest possible uh, protections across the whole of Europe, uh, but also, of course, uh, across the UK? And what does it mean uh, to no longer be part of the European Union? Does it help? Does it hinder? Uh, what can we do as a labour movement to rebuild some of the links? that we have lost uh, and where can we pick holes in the governments, the UK government's approach uh, in its uh, uh, setting fire, if you like, to regulations in the name uh, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, well, who knows what it's in the name of, it's in the name of Johnson, it's in his glorification. But anyway, enough uh, polemicizing from me. Um, I am absolutely uh, privileged and, and overjoyed to be able to introduce four excellent speakers uh, to you today. Uh, some of whom, obviously, uh, uh, I have worked with directly as former MEPs and, and uh, colleagues in the European Parliament, uh, but all of whom uh, I have worked with in one way or another uh, in the work that we did in the European Parliament in conjunction with the trade unions uh, and the PLP uh, to advance the cause of workers' rights across uh, Europe. Um, we will be joined by Elena Craster, who is the TUC's uh, European officer. She represents TUC in the European Union, uh, a vital uh, uh, link uh, and fantastic to have representation from the British trade union movement right at the heart uh, of decision making in the European institutions. We can leave the European Union, obviously, as we have, but to have that voice uh, that voice for UK workers uh, in Brussels is incredibly important and invaluable. Um, after uh, Elena, we will be joined by Jude Curtin-Darling, uh, who is the Deputy General Secretary at Industrial Europe, which represents over 7 million working people who belong to almost 200 trade unions and, of course, is a former Labour member of the European Parliament uh, for the North East uh, region. Uh, we will then be joined by Theresa Griffin, who is a Senior Associate at the European Climate Change Think Tank E3G and another former colleague of mine uh, in the European Parliament and former chair of the uh, EPLP, the European Parliamentary Labour Party, and a yeah. former uh, MEP for the North West region. Uh, and then uh, we will be joined by Mark, uh, Sir Mark Hendrick, Labour Member of Parliament for Preston, member of the International Trade Committee, and of course no stranger to European policymaking, having himself uh, uh, been in the European Parliament and uh, worked firsthand uh, on uh, issues uh, that we will be discussing today in the European institutions. So without any uh, further ado, and of course, please, by the way, feel free to post questions in the chat. We will be referring to them later. After each speaker has gone, we will have a, a, a Q&A session uh, as well. So it would be a great pleasure to uh, ask Elena, please, to uh, address us. And thank you so much for joining us and for um, sparing us your time today. Well, th thank you actually for um, um, organising this event. Um, I, I almost uh, given up on people being interested in, in this very important um, issue. Uh, I know people have the feeling the debate keeps rumbling on despite the referendum being six years behind us. Uh, but uh, the TUC definitely believes that this is unfinished business. Uh, because even the agreement we have with the EU is an imperfect uh, compromise on so many levels. Um, and in fact, we, we are already looking at um, how the deal could be, could be improved um, by, you know, a more receptive government, shall we say. And one of the areas we're focusing on, in fact, are precisely those provisions in the, in the agreement that we now have with the EU that seek to maintain uh, what is known as the level playing field on level on fair competition, um, which, which means, uh, you know, the two sides of the channel 
competing on fair labor standards and, and other uh, equivalent standards. But first of all, let me explain why uh, the trade unions are so reliant on the employment protections that have come from, from the EU and are terribly keen to seek these protections continue and not be rolled back. Um, in other words, what has the EU ever done for us? Well, you have to know that through the union's presence in Brussels, at the heart of Brussels, we have fought very hard to get uh, EU law that improved working conditions. You know, there's a quite long list of uh, now old uh, rights, such as those to unpaid parental leave, uh, time off uh, from work for family reasons, equal treatment for both Term contract uh, or agency workers and rights for outsourced workers in the framework of public procurement, um, but also information and consultation or health and safety protection. So, as you can see, the range of protections is quite varied. Uh, but I'd like to focus on a rather notorious example, which is the one of the Working Time Directive, um, which um, sets a weekly limit of 48 hours, but um, maybe less famously, uh, also gave UK workers a statutory right to pay annual leave for the first time. So uh, 6 million workers gained from such an improved holiday entitlement when the right was first introduced um, in 1997. Uh, and 2 million of these workers, in fact, had no previous annual paid leave. Um, and many of those workers were, in fact, part-time uh, women workers. So uh, what happens next is that the government likes to point out that the UK ha already has better standards compared to EU ones. Uh, but uh, you won't be surprised to hear that the TUC begs to differ. Um, you know, EU law only sets common minimum standards and there's nothing preventing the government from improving on those, except they're so uh, fearful of being accused of gold plating that they hardly ever done it. Um, and so to continue with the working time example, um, the government says that annual leave in the UK is much more generous because workers have uh, 28 days and the directive only prescribes 20 days. But you have to realize that they've done so through an accountancy trick because the UK includes eight bank holidays into the count. And if other countries in Europe were to do the same, you will soon realize that other countries in Europe, most other countries in Europe actually have a more generous annual leave entitlement than workers have in the UK. So the first lesson to draw is do not believe the Tories' narrative uh, that uh, rights are so good in the UK. In fact, the country can and should afford better rights for working people, and it can do so by introducing an employment bill, which we have waiting, been waiting for for a while now. Um, instead, what the government is doing is to demonstrate that there is a Brexit dividend, and so is trying to identify opportunities to deregulate, if anything, and setting up all, all sorts of uh, commissions uh, to do that. And we've already seen recent examples of rights that will be a risk with the announcement that the UK will deviate from general uh, data protection rules. Um, it, earlier in the year, it published a new subsidy regime and made a big hula la out of it, except that the deal we have with the UK, with the EU, actually ties the hands of the government. And so it's not clear that what they're suggesting is so fundamentally different from how things have been done up to now. Um, and it, it's very likely to happen with financial regulations, because as, as you re might remember, the city hates the EU bankers bonus cap, uh, just by way of example. Um, so what, what's going to happen to workers' rights? It's, it's cause for concern, um, but except that the government do know that 
uh, it would be extremely unpopular to engage in a in a full frontal attack. Uh, the majority of Tory voters uh, want to see all these employment protections maintained, and so. But this this doesn't exactly stop the government from acting on this front either. Uh, they did try in January uh, to engage in a review of employment rights, uh, but that was quickly back because there was a massive uproar. Um, but you know we should not we should not lower the guard. Uh, it, I mean it's clear that they will try again, and so. Perhaps they will try in a more subtle way rather than, you know, big ban taking away holiday entitlement to everyone. Um, they might try to tinker at the edges of the labour market. Uh, they might aim at employment law that, uh, you know, in their mind is only a concern for a smaller cohort of workers. Uh, so, for example, during the pandemic, in response to uh, pressures on the local and national supply chain, the Department for Transport extended the temporary relaxation uh, for the rules of driver's hours. Uh, so you have to know that the general rules of working time also have daughter rules regulating different sectors. And one of those regulations is the maximum time drivers can be on the road for safety uh, reasons, clearly. Um, and these rules, given the crisis of in the supply chain, empty shelves and all the rest of it, uh, were temporarily relaxed, except that this relaxation is now being extended twice or three times, if I'm not mistaken. And so we wonder whether they're trying to extend it so many times that the extension eventually becomes permanent. And then if the sky hasn't fallen in because no one has noticed, then they can continue uh, with this sort of salami uh, slicing tactic. Um, but the issue is that combined with the shortage of drivers that we're now seeing in the industry, uh, you know, the ones that are remaining are overworked. Uh, they're already suffering from poor working conditions. And so we think this can only spell disaster. Uh, and that the incentives that are uh, being offered by employers to join the industry are in fact just a temporary fix. And what, what is needed in, on the contrary is a general improvement of terms and conditions, uh, which will help not only to retain uh, the workers, but also to attract younger ones to join the sector with proper training uh, and, and improved pay. Um, the other way the government can eat at our rights is to simply uh, sit on the hands. So not looking at mirroring improvements uh, in the protections of work that the EU in the meantime might be uh, adopting. So I wanted to highlight that there is also a risk of you know, the UK moving away from common standards simply by not following the conversation that has already started on a number of uh, new rights, potentially. And I call this divergence by inertia. Um, and it's not a sort of future hypothetical remote risk. It's already happening. Uh, the conversation has started um, either of its own initiative or in response to uh, European Commission proposals, but the European Parliament is already debating how to provide new rights, for instance, to platform workers. And, you know, sister unions organized in the European TUC are already arguing that, for instance, these workers should be presumed to be, uh, to have an employment relationship with the platform and that the platform is just a standard employer. Uh, rather than forcing these workers to falsely uh, classify as self-employed. Um, there are also discussions on introducing a right to disconnect. Uh, it already exists in some countries, and it seems to have become a greater necessity given that the pandemic has accelerated a move towards uh, more remote working. And while the UK already has some provisions on gender pay reporting, for instance, uh, that only applies to companies that have more than 250 employees. And the conversation in the European Parliament 
is already moved towards a mandatory pay transparency um, provision. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are committees in the European Parliament that are, are actually arguing that that um, obligation should kick in at a much lower threshold, for instance, 10 or more employees. So you can see already that potentially uh, the rules uh, could diverge. And as a last example of things moving ahead and leaving us behind, potentially, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, the great injustices that have emerged throughout the, you know, supply chains uh, need to be tackled. Um, and there should be mandatory due diligence for companies uh, in a way that goes well beyond the UK Modern Slavery Act. So I hope that with this, I've given you an idea of, you know, what, what we have inherited and we're seeking to protect, but also what is likely to come in the future in the pipeline and we risk uh, being left behind unless this government chooses to act and introduce uh, much better protections in the UK labour market that is uh, plagued with levels of insecurity that we haven't seen uh, in many, many years. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you, Elena. That was methodical, clear, uh, and um, in no small measure alarming, but that's as it should be because we're in, a, in an extremely precarious position. I think you outlined perfectly that it's not just the fact that leaving the European Union means obviously you leave behind a certain legal framework that has provided uh, a, a common level of minimum protection uh, for member states, but also that in so doing the deal that has been arrived at is insufficient at protecting many of those rights. Uh, and then the third aspect, which I think very few people are talking about, and I'm extremely pleased that you uh, raised this, is that uh, there is a risk of things slipping simply by either, as you, as you say, inertia, uh, or indeed this kind of incremental approach that the government has that we see in a whole range of issues where they, they basically extend deadlines, they put in so-called temporary measures, and then wait to see what happens essentially and hope nobody notices and that's of course why it's so important that we have such a strong voice within the labour movement to put markers down yes of course we're not empowering government we we are an opposition and we have a government with a with a hefty majority in the house of commons but that doesn't mean that we can't uh, put a marker down to highlight the issues to embarrass the government and of course Put, uh, uh, put a very clear uh, mark down for when we do elect a Labour government and get rid of this uh, uh, awful regime. Uh, and then we can start, obviously, to, to put right what has what has started to go wrong. Uh, and Elena, as, as I said at the beginning, but I cannot say enough, thank you so much for all the work that you do in making sure that that crucial British voice is there from the trade union movement, because, you know, without the work that the TUC does in Brussels, I think it would be very much harder uh, for us to, to, to have that representation, but also for our sister trade unions and sister labour movements uh, to um, bear us in mind, quite frankly, <laughs> uh, and, and to remember that obviously we we have a specific um, fight that, uh, that, that we need their support and solidarity in. Which brings me uh, to the trade union movement across uh, the European Union and indeed beyond uh, and to the brilliant work that uh, Industrial Europe do in representing workers uh, across the continent uh, and uh, but by which I mean the continent uh, with, with a with a, a, a small C, not the uh, not the UK uh, version of the continent, the whole of Europe uh, in representing the labour movement and of course improving conditions uh, uh, throughout, which is something that uh, uh, Jude did as an MEP uh, on behalf of her constituents, on behalf of all of us, uh, and it's brilliant now that uh, that she is continuing that work in her role as a uh, as a vice uh, um, general secretary, De deputy general secretary, sorry, uh, of Industrial Europe. So Jude, please over to you. Thanks, Seb. Um, and um, it's really lovely to see so many uh, familiar faces um, from the northeast and from uh, from across the country. Um, so uh, I, I'm trying to juggle two hats here. Ex. MEP and Labour Party member and activist and um, and my seat next to Elena in the um, European trade union movement and I think Elena has uh, set out if you like one part of the story which is about um, job quality and the standards which um, ensure job quality and I've been asked to talk um, a little bit about uh, the employment impacts of um, of the current deal and and what we're seeing from particularly from the perspective of manufacturing workers. So I I now um, 
uh, speak every day on behalf of 7 million workers across Europe's manufacturing, energy and mining sectors. Um, and that includes all of the um, British unions organizing um, in our industries as well. So we, we are bridging, um, just as Eleanor is in the ETUC, we're bridging that gap um, at sectoral level as well. And I thought it was just kind of worth, in that respect, thinking back to where we were a year ago, um, ahead of uh, the, uh, in the autumn of, of last year, when really the big priority in the trade union movement and lots of the pressure was to avoid no deal and the dangers of no deal for working people across Europe. And there was enormous solidarity within the trade union movement from trade unions elsewhere in Europe towards um, their British counterparts in the perception that Brexit was going to damage everybody, but it was obviously going to damage um, British workers more. And lots of the, the work that Eleanor and I have done in the, in the trade union movement over the last uh, few years has been about trying to underpin um, that solidarity and ensure that solidarity in, in positions. But it becomes very difficult, I'll be very frank, when you have a deal um, which is only one inch away from the worst deal possible on the table. And the trade deal that was concluded by um, Johnson and Frost is a very hard Brexit. Um, we shouldn't be under any uh, kind of um, misconceptions. It's not no deal, but it's a very hard Brexit. And it has implications for many of our industries. Um, and that that was going to be the way as soon as the Tories decided that Brexit meant leaving the single market and the customs union, because we are so integrated um, in terms of supply chains and um, in companies and within industries and between industries that uh, for this is the first trade deal actually in history, which has been about constructing barriers and reducing trade rather than about opening up uh, trade and um, reducing barriers. And that changes the whole context of uh, the impact on workers um, in different industries across Europe. If I think about our members um, for kind of the trade and goods, uh, the positive thing was that it's a, a deal which ensures that there's no quotas um, and, um, and no tariffs. But there is an enormous increase in red tape absolutely enormous in every industry. Um, and uh, if I give you the chemical sector, I come from Middlesbrough, chemicals, big employer across Teesside. Um, we are part in Teesside, we're part of the North Sea Triangle, um, Teesside, uh, Rotterdam, the Netherlands and Antwerp. And um, the British uh, chemicals industry estimate that the cost of Brexit is about a billion pounds in terms of red tape. Um, to the industry. And we've already seen some sites in integrated supply chains where a chemical is moved across the, um, the North Sea as it's being pro processed to be transformed in another site in another country, that those sites have shifted and the investment has gone um, into in, within the, the European single market. So for, for goods, if you like, and for manufacturing, manufactured goods, the positive was um, has, uh, is slightly, there is a positive, if you like. For services, it's disastrous, um, this deal, um, partly because there's very little at international level in terms of trade and services. So uh, it's here really that we've seen big impact in terms of jobs, the relocation of operations, lost opportunities, particularly for people like independent freelancers who are providing business services, um, or consultancy services, which is something that Britain does best, um, but we have uh, given up. Um, and then gaping holes where EU nationals were present in, um, in key sectors. So it, the picture is mixed in different industries. Um, and, um, and I would say it's difficult to 
guesstimate the employment effect of Elena can be very concrete in terms of rights and what's happened in terms of rights I got the very nebulous subject because obviously we're dealing with Brexit in the context of Covid and the pandemic and everything can be wrapped up in different veils and it was very clear uh, towards the end of last year that there was actually a government strategy that you could go for a harder Brexit and cloak it in Covid and the economic impacts of Brexit could be wrapped up in a kind of um, pandemic um, cloak. So it's very difficult for us to distangle uh, the decisions for, you know, the reasons behind corporate decisions. That's what we find within the trade union movement. We're dealing with a lot of restructuring, um, a lot, a lot of wide across our membership, um, but defining that restructuring as down to one particular reason is very, very difficult. But if you look at the trade statistics, it's stark, a 37% drop in trade between the UK and the rest of the EU. Um, so then it's a question of when the employment impacts will come. And there's always a lag. Um, we, should be, we should be clear about that. And definitely Labour um, should be, um, in, in my view, really out on the front foot in um, preparing for that employment lag because it could be uh, quite significant once the protections that are in place, furlough and other protections start to roll back, um, what, what comes um, down the line. But we do have some, um, I'm a conscious of time, but I would flag up the really brilliant work of Yorkshire Bylines. Um, so volunteer citizen journalists who have been putting together what they call the Digby Jones Index. Uh, you'll remember um, that Lord, Lord Digby Jones with his uh, crystal ball predicted in the referendum that not a single job would be lost as a result of Brexit. And um, the, uh, the team at Yorkshire Bylines have been cataloguing, I think they're up to something like 230 examples of uh, decisions where jobs have been lost or relocations have been made where there's some connection to Brexit. So not all Brexit, but some um, connection to Brexit. And in some cases, directly as a result of, of Brexit. You can't add up all of those numbers together, obviously, that would be uh, far too easy. Um, but it's it's a useful tool, a useful index. And I think, um, you know, uh, it, it wouldn't be bad if uh, the Labour front bench were not hammering home against a Tory uh, peer, um, that index, which he is named after him. Then, so there are jobs where we can see that restructuring has happened, uh, that re there have been re relocations, that people are impacted. But in my view, the far bigger economic and employment impact is investments which didn't come. Investment decisions which were shifted elsewhere because of the context of Brexit. And in um, August this year, the chair of this is very unusual, I should say, the chair of the Northeast Chamber of Commerce, James Ramsbotham, who um, is very, anybody from the Northeast will know, very purposefully apolitical, wrote an absolutely blistering letter to, um, to Boris Johnson, crying out for help um, for businesses. Um, you'll, you may know, you may not know that the Northeast has always had a net export um, surplus. Um, we export more than we import, big export economy. And um, the survey this spring showed that 75% of businesses in the Northeast had been negatively impacted by Brexit. So the chambers took the unusual step of making a public appeal to the government. And within that appeal, there was one very striking example, which I thought just highlights this lost investment, private investment um, opportunity, and that's Hitachi. And it's personal to me because I went to the opening of the Hitachi site um, in Bishop in um, Newton Aycliffe, um, where um, which was largely down to the trade unions in the northeast, labour councils, labour MPs, and the company working to bring investment. And there was always the anticipation that there would be one site starting, and there was space for two more sites on the same plot. And those two sites aren't in the northeast. And James Rambotham said to said to the government. If you want to see where the investment is, you should head to Hitachi's new factory in Italy. And that's a very clear example of where the investment, private investment, has gone elsewhere. 
but alongside the private investment is the public investment, which was a massive driver of jobs. Um, and particularly in some of the regions which are the least advantaged in the UK. Um, so the replacement to the European structural funds is so paltry that it's embarrassing compared to the need. And it's based on pork barrel politics. This is a, a, basically a, a way of uh, Tory seats vying for each other to get that money rather than where European funds were allocated on the basis of economic need rather than um, any other criteria. And I think we should be far louder about this public investment because it was that public investment that leveraged the private investment into some of the poorest regions in Britain. There was a research, and I, I know Seb, I've got to shut up, but there was a research um, report done um, just before the summer. I'm a board member of the Coalfields Regeneration Trust, and we did a report with the Industrial Communities Alliance um, looking at the impact of COVID in old industrial Britain. And they are many of the uh, regions in the country which have been, were the target of European structural funds. And the impact of the pandemic has set those regions back over a decade in terms of basic equality criteria, health, education, employment, social um, inequality criteria. They are the regions which need this public investment and they are the regions which will be the hardest hit by the employment impact long-term when the pandemic veil is lifted from the country of this Brexit deal. And we, trade union movement, labour movement more generally, have to be there to put forward concrete proposals to deal with what is going to be an enormous social cost of the combined impact of Brexit and the pandemic, because otherwise we are setting ourselves up for an extremely hard future in combination with what Eleanor was talking about, about the rolling back of rights, the weakening of rights and undermining job quality. So I, I think this is the time where we know what's coming and we should be setting forward an agenda which really speaks to those communities and sets out a proactive, positive um, vision of what Labour can do in the future. And my last word would be, I would just, Eleanor talked about the HGV drivers who are clearly very, very visible um, in, uh, in the media. Lots of what's happened has been largely invisible um, up to now. But there was an excellent article in the FT, uh, not necessarily the home of the trade union movement, um, by Sarah O'Connor in August, which said neither the you know the remain voters i'll quote it and listen and then i'll stop remain voters are right to say that brexit helped to cause the current crisis but wrong to say that everything was fine without it and brexit voters are right to say migration helped suppress driver pay but as the netherlands has shown and other european countries brexit wasn't the only way to resolve it so let's set forward a common agenda about investment to create jobs, recognising the crisis that we face and really tackling the weakness of our labour market. So we guarantee the job quality for those in work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. And that, and that last message is incredibly important. It's very tempting for us who believe passionately that Brexit has not just is not just the answer to the problems um, that we face, but is actually taking us very much in the wrong direction. It's very tempting to uh, kind of light on arguments that dismiss uh, the rationale that people had for voting for Brexit in the first place. And of course, we have to recognise that, that, that things were very far from perfect uh, and are very far from perfect. Um, the difference, of course, being is that this government has alighted on a, an scapegoat uh, and, and, uh, and, and is pursuing a, a, a policy which is making things very much worse in, in, in areas that are uh, least resilient. And, and Jude, you've outlined brilliantly the, the, the range of costs that Brexit is imposing on many communities up and down the country. But of course, that critical aspect of lost opportunities, which is so difficult to measure. Uh, and the pandemic has frankly um, been an extraordinary act of providence to hide the impact, uh, the immediate impact certainly of Brexit on many sectors of the economy. It is extremely straightforward and simple to say that uh, um, uh, the damage that's being done in many sectors, particularly as you mentioned services being a, a one that is, is, is largely absent from any agreement with the EU, um, the, the damage having arisen from the pandemic and, and obviously uh, the reality is that uh, where damage has uh, occurred as a result of the pandemic, Brexit has 
tended to exacerbate it. Uh, and the uh, supply chain issue is, is a perfect example of that, where, where Britain is simply less resilient than other countries as a result of Brexit. Uh, and uh, uh, making that argument is going to be extremely difficult. But I, I do like your suggestion of the Digby Jones index being a key part of Labour's strategy going forward. And uh, uh, let me just take this uh, opportunity to uh, make a quick plug for the Labour Movement for Europe's rally, which is taking place on Sunday, the 26th of September 2021, obviously, uh, between 12.30 and 2 uh, at the Odeon Cinema in Brighton. So it's in the fringe of the Labour Party conference. If you are heading to conference or if you fancy a weekend in Brighton, why not? Uh, please do head along to our uh, our event at the Odeon Cinema. Um, the details are in the chat uh, and the Labour Movement for Europe really does exist for anyone who believes in a stronger relationship with Europe, whether that is just a slight improvement on the withdrawal agreement or if you're like me and you think we should have rejoined the European Union last Thursday, then please do join us and, 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 uh, and come and uh, uh, be part of our family. Um, Talking about family, uh, my next uh, speaker is Theresa Griffin, who was uh, a member of uh, European Parliament alongside uh, uh, Jude and I, uh, Jude and me at the uh, EPLP, he was chair of the EPLP, EPLP, an extraordinary campaigner, fighter, uh, and uh, a proud trade unionist. And I'm very proud uh, to have worked alongside uh, Theresa in the European Parliament and look forward to the next chapter of working alongside her. Uh, Theresa, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Seb. Can I just say it's wonderful to see uh, so many old friends and, you know, thank you for all of your support on social media. I completely agree with you. I see Richard Corbett. Richard was the MEP for Merseyside when I saw, can you hear me? When a Tory minister said that Liverpool could go into managed decline. And as Jude said, it was actually by Liverpool. Theresa, sorry, can I just stop you? Just sorry, I, I think your connection is a little bit unstable. Are, are you able to turn off your are you able to turn off your camera and hopefully that will help the audio come through? I don't know if Harry can turn off the camera. We can hear you now. Oh, can you? Okay. Thank Brilliant. you. Um, thank you. So basically, it was European structural funds that regenerated Merseyside when the Tory government said we could go into managed decline. We need to be very clear about that. The other thing that I wanted to pick up, what Elena was saying, was it was actually the SPD that tipped us off that Microsoft was going to bring a court case to say that UK trade unionists could no longer sit on European workers' councils, which is nothing to do with the trade and cooperation agreement. So we are still working very closely with Gabby, who is a wonderful uh, German uh, MEP who tipped us off and who worked with us. So we are continuing to keep those family links going with our sister parties. But to come to Northern Ireland, um, I have family in Derry, I have family in Donegal. And I remember as a child, crossing the border when a rifle was actually put into the car and I was about seven years old. So what we were absolutely determined to do was to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. And what the Northern Ireland Protocol helps prevent checks along the island border between Northern Ireland, which is after all in the UK, and the Republic of Ireland, which is still in the EU. And it's about preserving the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, which I have the privilege as a politician uh, to work upon. Um, 
the land border staying open avoids infrastructure such as cameras and border posts, which is really important. When we consider that we have 30,000 people that cross the so-called border every day to study, see families, work, see friends, also, as part of the Good Friday Agreement, we have 13 cross-border health agreements, which means that, God forbid, if you have a heart attack in Donegal, you will get taken to the nearest A&E in Derry and not have to go two and a half hours uh, down the road to Mayo. What's happening with those health agreements? Uh, the government can't tell me. But it is really important that we maintain those 13 gross border health services. So we have the protocol. Um, which means goods from me, such as Lawn and Belfast. Uh, milk and eggs are checked from non EU countries. Children's obviously means as um, and customs documents for the border in the Irish Sea. It was established the protocol on the 1st of January 2021 and is international law. No matter what Johnson says, it is international law. The grace period was extended firstly till the 30th of June, now till the 30th of September. Uh, UK has said, the Tory government, that it will ignore the rules of the grace period if it's not extended, although they negotiated the protocol. They negotiated it and they agreed to it and they are now threatening to renege on it. Uh, Johnson wants protocol, uh, that many compromises on the protocol, wants to get rid of most of the checks and reduce customs procedures. Although it was Johnson and his government and Theresa May that decided that we wouldn't stay in the customs unit and the single market. Uh, when you think that we have got regional cooperation agreements with our EU friends about the security of energy supply, and I had the privilege of working on that piece of legislation. So that when we were at times of energy threat in the UK, our neighbours would help us keep the lights on in our hospitals and the dialysis machines running. We are no longer part of the internal European market for energy, which is a complete nonsense and an own goal. Um, Johnson also wants to remove the role of the European Commission and European Court of Justice in how the protocol works. EU will not renegotiate and they are right not to and as the Labour Party we have got to be very clear on this. Article 16, uh, in my view the European Commission was wrong to trigger it, realised its mistake very quickly and withdrew it. And Article 16 is if there is either side can perceive economic, societal or environmental difficulty. So that's where we're at. A great deal of uncertainty. Make UK has just said that 17% of UK exporters are no longer training. There's a 50% fall in food and drink exports and there's a shortage, you will have heard, of blood tubes. As somebody who has a chronic condition, anybody that doesn't know me um, well um, uh, won't know that I've got rheumatoid arthritis because because of the drug I have to take, I have to have a blood test impact on my body. People practice tubes used. That's the situation that we're in. Meanwhile, in Northern Ireland, the North-South trade has seen a sharp increase with the value of goods being imported from Northern Ireland to the Republic increasing by 77%, while the value of exports from the Republic to the North has risen by 43%, according to the Central Statistics Office. This is why we have to protect uh, the protocol. And these economic shifts and opportunities are not isolated 
investment interest is being recorded across all sectors with Invest Northern Ireland reporting more than 30 direct investments on the horizon. Companies such as Citigroup, we cannot allow the economy of Northern Ireland uh, to fail. Um, this is in tandem with your implement senior civil service to oversee the operation of the Northern Ireland protocol, despite them saying publicly that they want to come out of it. How ironic is that? And it was reported last week that the UK's Department for International Trade has circulated an internal document for staff which cites the advantages of the Northern Ireland protocol among reasons to invest in the UK. So clearly there is a great deal of hypocrisy uh, going on. Northern Ireland remains a post-conflict society, still grappling with intergenerational trauma. Several areas continue to languish, steeped in deprivation, with as many as one in four children in Northern Ireland living in relative uh, poverty. The Northern Ireland Protocol could transform the economy and businesses and quite frankly, the Tories know this. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much, Theresa, and, and uh, thank you for um, your personal account there as well, obviously, of the, the impact uh, directly to you. Um, when it comes to Northern Ireland, I think the story is um, similar in, in terms of the UK government's approach to the UK as a whole, which is that this is very much an English-led project, by which I mean, of course, there are Brexiteers and people who support the idea of Brexit in every four corners of the United Kingdom, but that the desire to push ahead uh, without due regard to the nations and regions of the UK um, is something quite extraordinary, particularly at a time when that unity is under threat. But of course, the implications of that in uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic are so much worse uh, and uh, pertinent. Uh, and it was expressed time and time again during the referendum campaign. And people claimed that it wasn't a part of the campaign, but it was because I remember, Theresa, you and I very distinctly raising these points, was that, of course, um, the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement was actually predicated on the removal of checks, which occurred in 1992 with the creation of the single market. That was the precursor to the Good Friday Agreement. It wasn't the common travel area, but which dates from before uh, the uh, European Economic Community was set up. That relates to people uh, and uh, the ability to move between uh, different jurisdictions, but it didn't apply to goods. And it was the checks on goods the um, counter smuggling operations that were in place uh, at the border crossings, that was the hallmark of what sparked uh, in many border areas support for uh, uh, um, dissident activity. Uh, and of course, the spectre really of borders reappearing, whether that, that be a border on the island of Ireland or indeed the border that the government is trying to pretend doesn't exist between Great Britain and Northern Ireland has huge implications for uh, the peace process and for the stability of uh, both communities, unionist and nationalist uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so, Theresa, thank you so much uh, for uh, your um, comments and reminder of the issues there. Um, I want to uh, uh, now uh, bring in Sir Mark Hendrick, um, the Member of Parliament for Preston, who, of course, has also served as a member of the European Parliament as well, so understands uh, the uh, the nature of decision making in both European institutions and, of course, the uh, the House of Commons. Um, it, it, Mark, it's great to have us have you with us uh, here today. Um, we are, doubtless will have questions later about uh, uh, what next in Parliament and what we can do. Um, but please, uh, uh, if you could give us your thoughts at this stage, be very very grateful. My apologies, I accidentally muted you just then. I clicked on the wrong button. <laughs> okay, I've managed to unmute myself as well though. Uh, thanks very much, Seb. Uh, great to be here. Great to see so many faces who I was working as long back as 25 years ago within the European Parliament. Um, great to see everybody's still active and still fighting the good fight. Um, since leaving the European Parliament, which um, where I was very active on the internal market and single market issues more generally, um, I've done a lot of different things in the House of Commons, but certainly uh, post-Brexit, I wanted to really look at the effect that uh, missing EU trade would have on the 
the economy of the UK, but also in terms of, as we have today, the issue of jobs, workers' rights and the post-Brexit effects on those things. And for that reason, I'm going to focus very quickly, if I can, on three points. Um, first of all, the first trade deal that's been done, which hasn't just been a rollover or a, a cut and paste job of uh, our relationship with the EU. Um, second thing is, what does the Labour Party want, really, from, from trade deals? And thirdly, uh, the um, issue of free ports. What are they? What's, why is the government proposing them? And why I believe that they're, they're bad. But to start with, looking at UK-Australia, um, in early, sorry, mid-June of this year, the UK and Australia announced that they'd reached an agreement in principle on the key elements of a free trade agreement following the G7 talks between uh, Australia and the UK. And it's been hailed by the government as a historic mo moment, marking the first free trade agreement negotiated from scratch since Brexit, rather than one of the deals, as I mentioned earlier, carry, being carried over. And the government claims that this is a big negotiating win. Now, this so-called negotiation negotiating win has been quite controversial. Um, and it certainly hasn't been co well, controversial for the Australians or indeed problematic for, for the Australians because it's resulted in their tariffs on UK goods, which were already low, become even lower. The UK has reciprocated, reciprocated on greater access for Australian services. It's made it easier for young people from the UK to live and work in Australia, which is positive to the Australian economy, particularly for their farming industry, which counts on uh, casual labour. And um, all of these factors really combine to give Australia's agricultural companies a huge advantage of UK farmers in terms of production costs. So that when even the cost of exporting to the UK is taken into account, uh, they're still able in the DITs onwards to supply our domestic retailers and downstream producers at lower cost than domestic producers. So that's actually as, you know, in order to get this deal, we put ourselves at a deliberate disadvantage in terms of jobs and in terms of access to, to our market as compared to access to the Australian market. And of course, you know, to be dealing in food halfway across the world rather than just across the channel uh, raises the issue of food miles, but that doesn't seem to come into it. So it's not hard to see why Australia has been keen to reach an agreement and why um, it's going to consider to be competitive with domestic uh, and Irish producers uh, who have higher production costs. Looking quickly at um, what we want in a trade deal from the Labour Party, Labour's trade strategy called for high quality exports and decent jobs that, that go with them, as well as to uphold the highest environmental and social regulations in all UK trade relations. Now, the party called for dynamic alignment on workers' rights, consumer rights, environmental protections, so that UK standards keep pace as well. Support for trade unions internationally in their efforts to promote uh, collective bargaining and better pay and support and conditions. Um, we wanted to end all UK export finance to support fossil fuel projects and reject any trade deals that conflict with our climate principles. And of course, we wanted to use human rights to drive our trade policy, which is something very different from what this government has been doing. We also wanted to introduce legislation to ensure transparency and parliamentary scrutiny of trade and investment agreements. We've got that to a little degree, but it's nothing like as powerful as many other uh, legislature, particularly the United States. And of the 67 countries outside of the EU with which the UK formed deals in 2019, 14 have been ranked as having a systematic violation of workers' rights and 11 have no guarantee of workers' rights. Now, Emily Thornbury, our International Trade Secretary, said when these trade negotiations began in the run-up to Brexit, the government had a golden opportunity and a moral obligation to make clear to other countries around the world that if they wanted preferential trade deals with the UK, they had to uphold the rights of their workers. Now, looking at the impact um, from them, the ONS released data on the 25th of May this year, that sh this year that showed that total trade in goods with EU countries decreased by 23% and with non-EU countries by 0.8% compared to the first quarter of this year, 
uh, sorry, first quarter of this year with the poor first quarter in 2018. Exports to Ireland saw the greatest proportion fall of the UK's top exporting partners after the EU transition period. Imports from Germany have declined significantly and the continued impact of the virus combined with uncertainty has created huge volatility in UK trade and goods um, certainly to, to date now. And of course, this has had a big impact on jobs. Uh, lots of jobs that would have been created or jobs that would have been maintained and sustained have just disappeared. Quickly on to free ports, it's a designated geographical area which can benefit from concessions on customs, taxation and planning advantages and so-called reduced bureaucracy. The government's intention is to establish free ports in the UK and this announced locations of those free ports. Now, despite being within a country's geographical borders, free ports are effectively outside a country's customs borders. This means that goods imported into a free port are generally exempt uh, from uh, taxes and uh, levies of that type. And whilst my committee wants to you know, support the government's ambition to increase trade and investment, we don't see really how free ports uh, are going to do that. So looking at the time, as a bit I would have liked to have said, but I won't. But in summary, the Australia deal, which is the first not being a rollover or not an important improvement on, e -trade, uh, on EU trade, is a lopsided agreement in Australia's favour. And that's likely to be the case for future trade deals. Trade deals so far that have been looked at have not looked at high quality export, decent jobs, human rights, workers' rights, consumer rights, environmental rights and in fact um, have created their own red tape, which is that different from so-called EU red tape. And on free ports, um, it will effectively shift decent jobs and um, offshore. Um, those decent jobs, let's say, will be displaced to offshore jobs effectively. No taxes, customs duties, and as some colleagues of mine have described, it becomes a smuggler's paradise. Thanks very much, Seb. Thank you very much, Mark. And and um, the key argument I think that the government used when it comes to trade deals is that you know we now obviously have all this freedom and, and ability to strike out and, uh, and 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 do so much in the world. I mean, there's there's two sides to this. There's obviously the fact that these agreements will not entrench the kinds of protections that we have built up over many, many decades um, as part of a labour movement working with sister parties, sister trade unions across the whole of Europe. You know, it takes a lot of effort and time um, to build that level of protection up. You, 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 you cannot simply um, negotiate with countries like uh, Australia, or, you know, well, even Australia, but let, let's face it, China, the US, um, India, you cannot possibly uh, uh, hope to gain the kind of uh, protections on your own unless you have the, the support of critical mass, which of course is, is what, what uh, membership of the European Union affords. The other aspect, of course, is that none of what the government is proposing and negotiating in any way comes close to meeting the losses of, of leaving the single market. Um, and, you know, you can have scores of trade deals, um, all of which inferior, um, many of which uh, sacrifice, as we say, the protections and provisions that we built up, but will never uh, replace the economic value uh, and, uh, and value to communities that, uh, that being in the EU uh, did. So, yes, um, uh, incredibly uh, um, uh, varied uh, picture uh, that we've um, uh, painted this morning, uh, varied in the sense of the number of sectors, uh, areas of life, whether that be um, concrete examples on the impact on workers' rights, or indeed uh, the spectre of lost opportunities for uh, sectors as a whole. Um, not very much of it positive, um, because that's the nature of Brexit. Um, but obviously, uh, there are uh, ways in which we can fight back. Uh, uh, we can fight back as a movement, obviously, in calling for much closer uh, protections and a stronger, closer relationship with, with Europe. Uh, and there will always, of course, be those of us uh, arguing uh, the, the whole hog for rejoining the European Union, even if that sounds like a somewhat fantastical proposition at the moment. Um, Nothing lasts forever and everything can change after all. The Bill Cashes of the world plugged on 
uh, for decades uh, and uh, uh, emerged victorious. So I see no reason why uh, why we couldn't do the same. Um, there are lots of questions that have been posed. Um, some uh, are uh, um, of a very practical nature relating to existing um, rights. Um, I will attempt to um, select some of them. Uh, there is uh, a question about, this is from Marzina, um, what are the rules for family members visiting UK residents from the EU? Uh, I am a British citizen, however my parents are EU citizens, how long can they stay with me on a single visit? Um, so practical questions uh, and also relating to dual passport holders. How can we find out what our rights are? How long can we expect COVID restrictions to prevent visits within families? And what is the Labour Party doing about this, given its hard line on border restrictions? Um, I'm going to try and group that into a single question about uh, um, uh, the rights of family members. So uh, there's a there's a kind of there's two aspects to this in terms of COVID, the simple response I'll answer on behalf of everyone here is we don't know. We don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. And obviously, we don't know what the impact of, of ad hoc uh, changes to immigration rules are going to be. Clearly very disruptive, clearly um, extremely difficult at the moment to, to have um, the, the kind of uh, free flow and, and, and movement of families that we would want and expect, even as a non-member uh, of the EU. But uh, perhaps more um, concretely and, and longer term, the question about family rights, um, and uh, we know, for instance, there is a, a story that um, has emerged. Uh, well, these, it's, it's not that these stories are just emerging. We've known about them for some time, but what I mean is there's this focus on them in the media now about family members who are being denied the right to join uh, other members in the UK uh, as a result of uh, a deadline that is uh, that is uh, impending. I know, Jude, that you um, have, have tweeted about this this morning. Um, so perhaps if I ask you to address that, um, I'm going to try and do, do questions in groups of threes if I can. Uh, the, um, uh, there's a question from Jay Mandel about environmental and consumer safeguards uh, on a breakout clause to the UK-Australia trade deal, which would enable a Labour government to withdraw from the, withdraw from the agreement if it could not be renegotiated to incorporate EU equivalent standards on environmental and consumer safeguards. Mark, if I could ask you to uh, address uh, at that point uh, about um, potential um, renegotiation of trade deals done under this government in the event of, of, of a, a Labour government coming in. Um, and also a question from Carol Tong. Uh, nice to see you, Carol, um, about um, uh, ensuring and defending cultural diversity in any FTA, uh, is it the case that Labour wishes to defend that cultural diversity and ensuring that no FTA could undermine cultural sovereignty in adopting public policy in support of, of, um, of the film and television and other creative uh, industries? Um, and let's have a third question um, uh, from Sandy Paul. It's, it's more of a statement, but it's a challenging one. Um, Solidarity from an EU citizen residing in Tower Hamlets, East London. I have finally cancelled my membership of the Labour Party as I refuse to be a member of a political party that overtly abandoned EU citizens and has clearly become right wing, both nationally and locally, in order to court right wing Brexiteer voters. However, I naturally remain committed to the anti Brexit cause, albeit as an independent individual outside uh, the uh, Labour Party. Uh, I would certainly take issue with some of those points, but uh, but nonetheless, it's good to be challenged. Uh, first of all, Sandy, before I hand over, I would say don't leave the party, whatever you do, because um, it is a Labour government that is the uh, uh, the first and essential step in reversing uh, much of the damage that we're talking about. But obviously, uh, it's uh, it's clear that there is um, some discord out there, and it would be silly of us not to pretend. Uh, silly of us to pretend that there isn't. So. Three very broad questions. I, I know Jude and Mark, I've come to you specifically, um, and then Elena and, and Teresa, if I could ask you to, to give your thoughts as well. Um, Jude, if I come to you first. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question of citizens' rights uh, occupied an enormous amount of our time um, before, while we were in Parliament, uh, while we are in the European Parliament, I should say, ahead of uh, um, exiting at the end of um, January last year. And many of the um, examples of where uh, families have found themselves in 
in difficulty because of uh, the rules around citizens' rights were actually issues which were very um, prominently uh, raised by MEPs um, in the course of the negotiations. And to be quite honest with you, part of it is because um, you can have um, an agreement on citizens' rights between a country and uh, a, a group of countries like the EU, um, but human lives are complicated, families are complicated. We're, there are relatively few of us who have a kind of nuclear 2.5 standardized uh, family or story. And within those um, rights, what was very clear right at the beginning of the negotiations was that the whole framework was for a model, a so-called model normal, if you like, family, not families which had um, older children, uh, second um, second relationships with children, uh, cross-national relationships beyond UK um, and EU 27 um, nationalities and, um, and also caring responsibilities for older members of families or younger members of families who weren't direct um, uh, children. So there was a lot of discussion in the European Parliament about uh, the examples of um, family relationships which didn't fit with the model which was within the negotiations. And over the years within the EU, many of these questions have come up uh, when we were EU member um, members um, as within European legislation. And the story in The Guardian, for example, this morning about the family, which some of you may have seen, um, about a family, um, it's a, a very tragic um, uh, story of uh, a family being separated and uh, a mother having to move to the UK with the, the child and the, chi the headline is something like, uh, my son's um, crying out, where's my daddy? Or it, something along those lines. This is a very particular area of uh, citizens' rights, which is covered in Europe by something called the Surinder Singh um, rules, which is which covers the rights of na European nationals who are married to non-European nationals and their rights to um, citizen to residents to um, all of the the gambit of citizens' rights. When we left the European Union, what is complicated is that those rights, which were guaranteed in European law, were then having to be taken into um, consideration in through the uh, withdrawal agreement. And a deadline was put in place for Surinder Singh cases of um, UK nationals with non-EU partners who have European residence is quite complicated um, to be covered uh, by by those um, rights and that that's the deadline which is which is coming up now the whole area of citizens rights is complicated in that um, there are now uh, for EU nationals uh, living EU 27 nationals in the UK there is the settled status um, uh, kind of system um, there have been um, a number of cases of people who have uh, been um, uh, wrongly or uh, questionably denied settled status. What I would say is that in those cases, there is an independent authority in the UK, which is meant to be overseeing uh, the settled status scheme. And you can take cases to that independent authority. If I have time, I will try and put it in the chat so that if anybody and needs to, um, needs to cross-reference. But if you Google it, you will also find the um, independent authority for EU, for UK nationals in the rest of uh, the EU, um, which is also a point which is raised, how can we find out about our rights, um, uh, dual nationals or UK nationals elsewhere? Um, it's a, a slightly more complicated picture as many of the, um, the rights are now um, based on national, um, uh, national rules in every member state. And, um, and therefore, I would, I would point you in the direction of an organization called British in Europe, um, which has been su supporting um, British nationals 
who are inside the European, the EU 27 um, and how, can offer legal advice about what rights are and, and what the situation is in each member state. Um, but this is one example where divorce is messy. Um, and in some ways, um, those of us, and I include myself in that, I'm now a new Belgian. Um, my husband is Belgian and I've, uh, I got Belgian um, nationality um, uh, recently. And, um, and in, for, for many of us who took advantage of the fact that we were, I was born in 1977, I've only known uh, European, the, being a member of the European Union. I took my uh, freedom of movement as a right that could be acted on and many of us did and it was an acquired right. I didn't expect it to be taken away from me without my um, decision that it would be taken away uh, from me. Um, and we are in some ways the children of this divorce. And the tragedy of Brexit is that actually the children of this divorce have been treated really, really badly by politicians. Um, and I have absolute sympathy from, for the, the person in the, the chat from Tower Hamlets who feels that they haven't been properly supported. Um, I, I have other EU nationals in my family who have made the journey in the other direction and live in the UK and feel absolutely betrayed um, by a government for, in a country in which they have um, worked and paid tax and contributed and have fully integrated and feel absolutely um, kind of uh, um, undermined um, by the whole of the, the narrative of Brexit and the whole of the, the way that the, the story is unfolded. And, and then I'll stop, but the worst part of it for many people is that they didn't have a vote in the decision which fundamentally changed their lives more than anybody else's lives. And the second part of the other thing is that they were assured by the negotiators after in 2016, after the referendum, that they would be uh, that their life, that their lives wouldn't change and that they would be protected in the case of a Brexit agreement. And they are right to feel betrayed on both of those counts. And we as the Labour Party have to book up and actually respond to that sense of betrayal um, because it's. I think, you know, we are the children of this uh, of this Brexit deal and a lot of people, and you can probably hear it in my voice, a lot of people remain extremely angry um, about the way that the whole thing has run through. So um, sorry if I'm a bit emotional about it, but it is a very personal question as well as a, a technical question. I'll try and find the links. I've actually already replied to Marjena with the UK government link. If you have family visiting, for, who are EU nationals to the UK. I'll put that link in the main chat as well, but I'll also put the um, independent authority for settled status. Thank you. Uh, no need at all to apologize for being emotional. These are uh, extremely uh, personal and um, you know, resonant uh, issues that, that affect the way in which people lead, lead their lives. And yes, there are people like us who want to join the EU again, um, but actually, you know, it, 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 a lot of what we're discussing could be solved by the um, the reimposition of, of free movement, the ability to avail uh, oneself of the right to live, work freely, study, uh, meet people, build networks, uh, have the same uh, opportunities that every other young person uh, or any person indeed in the rest of uh, the European family has the ability to do and British citizens have been frozen out from that uh, and EU citizens frozen out from access to this country in many practical respects and it has implications as Judah said that run throughout a whole gambit of things. Um, that sorry I, I, I'm abusing my position again to to polemicize slightly but but Judah thank you so much for your, for your comments there and I'm, I'm going to move just very quickly I'm conscious that we are running out of time so um, apologies for kind of darting around a bit but I just uh, Mark, if I could bring you in on the uh, trade question very quickly. Um, what, what scope is there really for us to revisit some of these agreements uh, later down the road? Um, obviously, as, as former MEPs, we know 
that the European Parliament has right of veto on trade agreements, which is not the case with, with the House of Commons. What, what, what is the potential for a future Labour government to undo things? What can the current uh, Parliament do to mitigate damage? Um, what, what flexibility do we have? Well, first of all, <clears throat> the UK Parliament can veto um, trade deals. It's just that you need a majority to do it. And if a Conservative government obviously agrees one, and they've got a majority, then it's theirs for the taking. But just to deal with a couple of points, I think Carol uh, Tong raised one, and also uh, Jay Mandel, about a breakout clause. I mean, I'm certainly not aware of any breakout clause, and I would very much doubt if the Conservatives have put in a breakout clause. That's the last thing I think they would want. But, I mean, it's a bit like um, President Trump wants to renegotiate terms of NAFTA, like he did, and he, bully, he bullies the others into doing it, and uh, he gets a new deal that suits the US better than it did previously. Um, now, to expect the UK to be able to do that in a whole range of bilateral deals that are likely to come on stream before we see another Labour government, I think is extremely unlikely, although it is technically uh, possible. But, I mean, you know, some of the things we're looking at, I mean, Carol mentioned putting in conditions about cultural diversity and we wouldn't agree to a free trade agreement that would un undermine that. Um, I know where Carol's coming from, obviously, because I served with Carol in the European Parliament when we were concerned about European content, and in particular, in many cases, French content in broadcast material. Um, but, I mean, these are things that can be negotiated, but if you're threatening to come out unless those specifics uh, are agreed, the likelihood is that you are likely to, to be able to or to, to leave a trade agreement um, and just negate the agreement, um, you know, on the basis of it's a bilateral deal, you're quite at liberty to do that if you wish to do that. However, there becomes a problem when, let's say, we did want to um, change our terms of an agreement with Australia or New Zealand, uh, for that matter. We're also in the process of trying to enter the, so what's now called the CP. Uh, TPP, which is the sort of successor from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Donald Trump said he didn't want anything to do with and has withdrawn from, but Joe Biden is now indicating he might want to be part of. Even the Chinese are interested in getting involved with it, which is all quite bizarre for the UK to be trying to get involved. When we've withdrawn from the European Union, but now we're trying to get into some sort of Trans-Pacific trading arrangements on the other side of the globe. Barmy me when you think about it, but that's where we are. But if we did have an arrangement with um, uh, New Zealand or Australia for that matter, then once we're into a CPPP, TPP arrangement, then we'd be tied into that as well. And falling out with New Zealand or falling out with Australia certainly would undermine any trading arrangements that we might have in any CPTPP uh, agreement. Um, and obviously it would make sense at that time if we had a Labour government, obviously, to, to look at perhaps improving relations closer to home, uh, rather than trying to mess around with individual issues that are in existing agreements. Now, I know some of this can be very, very important, as we've discussed, you know, human rights issues, uh, rights of workers, um, consumer standards, environmental protection standards, all of these things that we value are the reasons why this, this government left the European Union, because with these agreements, you don't have to pay as much attention to that sort of stuff. So for us to retrospectively try to put some of that stuff we care about into these bilateral deals, I think is less realistic than actually in longer term getting back into the EU and then trying to use the EU as a mechanism to improve these sorts of standards and arrangements for trade and to do business more generally and improve the rights of workers uh, and human rights more generally. I think that would be the way forward. Not, not that I'm suggesting at the next general election, we should have a, a policy to go straight back into the EU. I don't think that's practical. But what I think we should be doing is looking at certainly ways in which we can improve access, if not some degree of or associate membership on, this, on the single market, look at we could, how we could uh, improve our uh, involvement with um, the customs union, such that a lot of the barriers that have been installed since we left the EU are actually put back such that we can take that first step maybe to, towards getting back. And then once we're back, I think we can look at these more broader global trade issues and look at how we can you know, make the world a better place through 
views in the European Union as well as our own relations, hopefully built up through these trade deals uh, that have gone on prior to us rejoining the EU. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. I don't think you find many uh, voices that would demur from, from what you were saying there uh, in terms of uh, the, the overall strategy, rather than dealing with the individual negative points of, of, of this government's trade strategy, we need to look much more strategically about where, where our greater interests are and, of course, what it means to, um, uh, to, to, to actually um, build back our, our economy and build back the opportunities that we need. Now, um, we are very short of time, but um, Michael Elliott, I see you have your hand up. I will bring you in. Don't worry. I will bring you in in just a second. But um, Elena, if I could just come to you um, about the uh, specifically about a question from, from Tony, actually, in terms uh, who says, uh, what can be done now to persuade the 52% who voted for Brexit that their reasons for voting Brexit has not had the intended benefits? Um, so how do we reach out to uh, members of our communities who, who you know, feel passionately that leaving the European Union is the only way to redress some of the uh, uh, inequality issues that we, we, we spend um, our working lives fighting against? You know, what, what can we do to turn around you know, this idea that somehow what the government is doing, it's doing on their behalf? What role can the trade union movement play uh, in promoting that, uh, that message? So I would start by saying to Sandy that he may have left the Labour Party, but I hope he, he, he hurries up joining a union unless he's already a member. Um, and that is because you know, we, we have continued to care about what happens to EU nationals uh, and we are also in the process of updating our guides for um, EU nationals in the, in the UK. And, you know, strange partnerships have been formed uh, out of Brexit, including with embassies from EU countries who, who have accepted to co-sponsor our guides and disseminate them through their communities. So, you know, it's an example that the links are still strong and, and that we find a way of, um, you know, continuing to protect workers wherever their passport. And on persuading people that perhaps have been barking up the wrong tree, if I can depict some of the positions, um, I think it would be legitimate to spend some time concentrating on uh, domestic issues, if you like. Uh, there is a terrible need to right the wrongs uh, that the pandemic has put, you know, has shone a light on. Um, and there is a real need for, you know, fill, filling the, the, the gaps and the, and the, you know, immense inequality that there is throughout the country. Now, the TUC does not believe that what the government has currently proposed in terms of levelling up is going to do the trick, but other policy, policies that the trade unions and other, you know, progressive organisations, if you like, are putting to the fore, perhaps will go some way to, you know, reassuring um, and th those uh, voters. And once the toxicity has been taken out, of, of, of the debate, then, uh, you know, th those people too might, might look, uh, you know, at the whole debate with, with a fresher look. Uh, but I would say, I think it's premature to go in and say, we need to rejoin now. I think there are many other problems to be tackled first. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, that's not to the exclusion of seeking further improvements to the relationship we have with Europe, which we will continue to do. Uh, but there are big challenges for the, for the countries, in countries, uh, industrial strategy, you know, greening jobs, uh, making sure that no one is left behind. So I know it sounds all very generic, but it's because the challenge is massive and it spans a really great range of, of, of issues. But uh, I think the TUC will keep out of this debate of whether to rejoin just for the time being. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot in terms of uh, <laughs> is the TUC yeah. campaign to rejoin? No, absolutely. Uh, you, the points you make are, are very well received indeed. And uh, uh, I think also just to, to build on what Mark was saying about the kind of sequencing. Um, yes, of course, um, you know, the Labour movement for Europe 
uh, exists to promote a closer relationship with the EU. And of course, the vast majority of our members want to rejoin the EU. But similarly, we also know that this is a staged process that, uh, that will rely on many different uh, factors, but crucially, of course, um, and first and foremost, we have to have a Labour government and we have to have a Labour government that reverses in the immediate in, you know, effect uh, of the, the domestic policies that this government is pursuing that make the lives of communities and workers very much harder. Uh, and of course, that is our number one priority and of, of, it is a, a necessary but not sufficient step on the path back to a more strategic uh, and more aligned future with Europe and one day rejoining the European Union. So uh, absolutely, this is this is not uh, a, a, an easy or simple process. Um, uh, Theresa, can I um, just bring you in uh, quickly in terms of um, the message to supporters who have perhaps drifted away or who um, are seeking inspiration? What can we say to them to remind them that actually, you know, we have a, as, as a party, we are inherently pro-European. That is who we are, that is, that is uh, in our DNA. How do we remind people and, and campaign for that, whilst also being mindful of the fact that, you know, an immediate campaign to rejoin the European Union is not going to be in the next Labour Party manifesto? No, no, no indeed it's not. And really, I see that Anne Black is also on this call. Uh, lovely to see you, Anne. Um, I think it's really important that um, our shadow team is more vocal, more vocal about when it impacts upon their subject area, i.e. health. So John Ashworth actually talking about uh, blood capsules, etc. But also when it impacts upon their constituency. So I'm doing a bit of work at the moment with the MP to speak in Liverpool because the um, the vaccine for over 65s for flu is different. It's made in Liverpool, apprenticeship, growth all around it, investment that has been targeted, hugely important in one of the most important and poorest wards in Liverpool. But the ingredients come from three countries. So in time production, so to get Maria talking about the job impacts and the apprenticeship impacts within her own constituency and to get our shadow team talking about the impacts on their subject matters, i.e. health trade. Um, I'm pleased to see uh, that Emily and, and Bill Esterson and that team are being much more vocal now, which I think is really important. But it's also how to make the stories real and personal. And Elena and Jude um, had both uh, touched on that. Because, for instance, Elena, um, I've got a 25-year-old who's a party member and fairly versed in all of this stuff. And she had no idea the right to paid holidays, the right to maternity leave, that that wasn't just what everybody had, that they were employment rights born in the European Parliament, she had no idea. So I think we need a dialogue with our young people who are completely suffering uh, from lack of, of freedom of movement as well, sir. So. Brilliant, thank you, Theresa. Now, I did say we would finish by half past, but I do know that Michael Elliott has had his hand up for a very long time, and we are replete with former members of the European Parliament. In the <laughs> but I, I see, uh, I, I'm very keen to bring you in, Michael, if I could ask for a, a short contribution. Thank you very much. You, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Um, first of all, I'd like to say how nice it's been to see taking part in this meeting so many former colleagues and friends and so on. Um, sadly, um, those of us who were in the parliament in its first uh, 20 years as a directly elected body, uh, so many of uh, them have died and passed away uh, in the last uh, couple of years or so, people like Stan Ewans and Ian Smith and many others who contributed so much. Um, it's been interesting listening to the debate, although um, trade relations were not my particular specialism in the parliament, but it's uh, proved to be one of the most um, um, problematic of the uh, situations we're now facing as a result of the uh, absurd decision to leave, which um, I think people were deceived uh, totally over. Um, can I just say that sadly I won't be able to be at the meeting in Brighton. These days I'm not uh, uh, Is it my connection? Or... 
or I think I think we might have lost Michael, um, which I, I, he was coming to a, a denouement, I think, in what he was saying. Uh, he he won't be able to come uh, to our rally, um, but we we will, uh, I hope, um, be recording it, certainly, and making, making, it, making it clear, as we are with this meeting, of course, uh, that you can uh, uh, attend or certainly watch what, what happens at the rally and listen to people's speeches. But if you are able to attend, just to sum up the discussion that we've had today, please do uh, 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 join us at our rally if you are in Brighton, either for the conference or if you are uh, um, uh, even just visiting Brighton and, and wish to come along and attend and hear what we're saying. Um, the uh, event really is obviously to make the case for a stronger and closer relationship with Europe, uh, recognising the many pitfalls in the deal that this government has uh, negotiated. I think it's imperative that in the first instance, we need to chip away at the trust that people have in Johnson. And he's doing a very good job of that on his own uh, by uh, reneging on his manifesto promises and the increase in national insurance contributions and the 10 percent increase in tax that that will represent for the lowest paid in our country is a good example of how he breaks his manifesto promises. But we have to play our part in chipping away at the idea that Brexit, his flagship policy, is in any way going to help working communities or build on uh, their quality of life and improve um, the, 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 the life chances of the next generation. It will do the exact opposite. Uh, and it's incumbent on the Labour movement to make those points, because that is part and parcel, I think, uh, of our strategy for winning the next general election, which is to undermine that trust that people uh, have placed uh, in the Prime Minister and to demonstrate that he is inherently untrue trustworthy. Um, I want to thank all of the speakers who have given up their Sunday uh, mornings and indeed afternoons. Um, thank you in, in Brussels. I know it's, it's gone lunchtime. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to Elena, to Jude, to uh, Teresa and to Mark and to all of you for joining us today. Um, as ever, please do join the LME. All the links are in the chat there. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, um, please do join us at our next event and stay in touch. Thank you.